our special speaker and all week long to hear the Word of God preached, but already you're in the midst of uh, worship, in the midst of prayer, in the midst of singing, and that's uh, very simply class participation time. And you have had that. Well, now you can participate by listening, by putting on your ears that hear. So you've got to get your Bibles out. you also got to get out one of these for me, okay? Because I just need to take a couple of minutes to remind you of what's going on this week. Any of you do not have one of these uh, wonderful brochures, would you raise your hand? And uh, we have some uh, good-looking uh, ushers today. Last week, we didn't have the good-looking guys, but this week we do. And um, the thing is, though, they're, um, they need to be whipped into shape. So raise your hand and keep it up, because we might be here till like 11.30, Steve, and you won't have a chance to preach for more than 10 minutes. Do we get it? Keep it. There you go. We're 100% covered. Wow. There you go. Just like the blood of Jesus washes away every sin. There you go. Brochure, back, simple. The middle is for you to read later. I'll give you an opportunity to read a little of the, bio, uh, the biological, hmm, biographical information of all our guests this week. Justin Gambino will be with us tomorrow to integrate with our worship team, and that'll be wonderful. Uh, already some beautiful singing and some wonderful worship and praise time, but uh, besides that, with all that's on the inside, on the back is your schedule and your opportunities. Here you have a layout of, hey, I could make some time on Monday. I could make some time on Tuesday. I could make some time on Wednesday. I know that you have a lot of things to do, and uh, most of them, I'm sure, are very, very important. But this is really important. And uh, some people have driven a long way to be here. And some people have traveled to be here, and they want to be part of these next few meetings. We're having a meeting over our missions, and this is, as I've told you before, our championship season time. We champion the Lord Jesus Christ and the mission of the church. We are in missions. We believe in missions. We believe in family and God's family. We believe in using sports in our community. And truly, this missions conference time in the Acts 1-8 calling of the church is so significantly important. So find time to be here. Thank you for being here this morning. And I want to highlight something that, uh, again, in finishing this all up, is Sunday evening. We don't normally have a Sunday evening uh, time and gathering corporately. There's small groups and different home studies and things. We have uh, different uh, gatherings out on the sports park on Sundays. But uh, this is a time of year, one time, one Sunday evening, to be able to be here. And so please, if you can, Jose Voltaire is going to be speaking this evening. Uh, we heard, some of us heard from him that we're here Wednesday night. He is pastoring in Honduras, Vida Nueva, Honduras. And we had a small team go there, of course, just a few weeks ago. Um, in the beginning of the first week of August, he's going to be preaching the Word of God David Guadron is uh, preaching right now in our 1030 service. Nelson preached in the 9 a.m. service already. Uh, is he tired out? He's worn out? He, he didn't make it into, I don't know. Is he, he doesn't want to hear you preach, brother. Oh, gosh. Oh. And you're going to say nice things about him. Maybe he's in the lobby and he'll hear it through the TV and come on in. But, but no, we already had Nelson preach the Word of God and 9 o'clock service over in the fellowship hall. So again, the opportunities are we have children's missions and we have children's care over here on this side all week long and of course this evening as well. So please, if you have children, bring them and they'll have a great time as well listening to Bible stories and missions stories all week long for our children as well, which is tremendous. Um, and just one additional thing, you see your commitment card. Please take the time to pray over that. Turn that card in to our basket right here. Uh, this week, today, um, there is, of course, your commitment to the General Mission Fund to give to missions. It's like your faith promise, your promise to give by faith to missions above your tithe, above your normal weekly tithe. That is something that our church has been so, uh, so deeply involved in all the years that I have been here. And what a blessing. And 
Vida Nueva, Good News in Action, is a beneficiary of all of you giving to missions, and we're thankful because ultimately it's for the gospel, for people's lives to be changed, to be brand new in Christ and saved and discipled and plant, churches planted, and that's what you're going to hear about over the next few days and, of course, this morning. So make sure you grab this and do something with it. It's also an opportunity for you to give to our 25th anniversary. Can you believe in May? It'll be 25 years of celebrating our anniversary of being out here as a church plant uh, from Kansas City Baptist Temple years ago. So please take the time to pray over and to do something with what God has put before you. That's why I come back to this morning and in introducing our guests. I'm thankful you're here again. You can be anywhere and do many, many things, but this is important, and we're gathering to worship the Lord, and uh, Steve Kern has been a guest a few times. He's a friend of our church, a brother, a dear friend, and uh, he's one of the few people that originally from Plattsburgh, uh, Plattsburgh, New York, that got saved, just like I'm one of the rare ones from New Hampshire, uh, and God has used him in a tremendous way, and as Salvador with his wife Pam for many, many years, please welcome Steve Kern, our preacher and guest all week long and this morning. Steve, it's all yours. The clicker's still... Okay, good. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning and to be with you. I was telling the first service that um, usually I'm a very nervous person, very, very nervous person. And so uh, I don't feel as nervous here because I'm among friends. So I, I really like that. I know so many of you, you guys are such a blessing. You have the same heart as us for, for ministry. Um, whenever I explain what we're doing in, in El Salvador, and, and uh, I know you're doing the same thing here, trying to do the, you know, the same thing, but it's, it's, of course, different, the results in every place. But your teams have been such a blessing. I see different people that have come on teams here. And uh, I hope you keep sending the teams. You know, it was a big step of faith to send that team August, um, around August 1st, and it was incredible. We had um, only six from your church, but had, we added 10 new families to our church there in San Pedro. So this is just an incredible thing, what God did. And so um, it's just, we appreciate it. And I know you pray for us. Um, I appreciate that so much. Um, uh, Debbie Summers prays, leads up a team that prays for us, and she's always sending me for prayer requests and everything. And I know you guys are doing that. I just really appreciate you guys. Love you guys. And uh, my wife is doing great. Everyone's been asking me about her. We just celebrated our 40th anniversary, and um, I'd saved up for many years to be able to go to, to Maui, Maui, Hawaii, and um, I've, actually it was very cheap because of COVID. You know, the, the governor um, has asked people not to be going there if they don't have to, and I said, well, I have to. It's my anniversary. So um, <laughs> everything was, was pretty, and we just had a great time. And so I wanted to come to this missions conference. I just got too much to do you know, in the church. I, mean, I can't be traipsing around the world like you. You know, I've got to, I got to, you know, so she's more committed to our church than I am. But the truth of the matter is um, we have a team that's in El Salvador this week and um, we haven't had a team come to El Salvador actually for two years. So it's, um, um, she's not heading it up, but she's helping the guy that's heading it up with a lot of the logistics. But she says hello to you and, um, and our family's doing great. People always ask me about our family. We have four children our oldest is in uh, Qatar. Um, uh, her husband is an engineer like she is, but she's kind of doing underground mission work while he's working. He works with a Baker Hughes that does um, um, petroleum drilling and everything. And she has three children. And then my second one is in Houston. And she's a nurse practitioner, and her husband's a pastor, and they have three children. And then my youngest girl lives in um, Fullerton, California, which is near, near Anaheim where Disneyland is. And she has three children. And all three of the girls have two boys and a girl. So it's easy to remember. Nine kids, six boys, or nine grandchildren. And then we have one boy, and he's not married yet. He's 34, and he lives in Houston also. They're all doing, they're all doing great at this moment. They're not always, always doing great, but at this moment, everyone's doing great. So if you ask me all about them. And, um, you know, I feel like I have a responsibility as um, you guys have supported us so much, you know, everything we've done, all the stuff I tell you about what's going on, you guys have had a big part of that. And um, my wife and I just celebrated 36 years of living in El Salvador, September 14th. And um, I always have to give a report of the results. And we've had over 380,000 people make professions of faith and help start 63 churches. And you guys have been a big part of that, you know, what we've done and everything. And 
Um, we just started a church in Mexico City, and Randy Adams was telling me, signing you guys up to come from Mexico City. And of course, you had not been to San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and just tremendous results. It's a joy for me that you get to hear from our missionaries. They are Salvadorians, but they have gone out to other countries. When we moved to El Salvador in 1985, our, our desire was to just start churches in that country. But God placed it on our heart with Julio, who's been here before, to send out missionaries to the rest of the world. And so um, he mentioned uh, um, Jose Walter, who is going to be preaching tonight. He's, he's uh, Salvadoran. I remember when he got saved in our church, and we sent him to Honduras. And we do the same thing as you guys. Discipleship after a person becomes a believer, and, and they grow, and then they go through similar to your program that after discipleship. And we're hoping they can go to maturity, and many of them become missionaries, which is a blessing. And then uh, you can hear David Guadron, who was in our church, and we sent him to Colombia, and Nelson Rivas, who actually helped us start our church in San Salvador. And we sent him to Guatemala, and, and he's there. So please listen to them on the hour before the preaching, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you can. It'll bless your heart. Because a lot of times here in the States, if I'm reading things right from my friends and what I hear from people I know, a lot of times I think Christians here think, you know, God's losing where we're losing this place, it's going down the twos. But God's, he's still on his throne, winning like crazy. And you see that on the mission field a lot. You see that we're just seeing all kinds of people that are coming to know the Lord. Christianity is moving that way. Um, I was just in a mission conference three or four years ago, and uh, this missions expert um, said that there are more missionaries sent out of Central America than the United States. And so... Um, that's where it's moving. It's, all, it's moving to that part of the world. And I realize the Philippines and other countries also are sending out a lot of missionaries. But it's a joy for me. And so um, I don't want to talk about everything going on because I will be talking about it during the week. And you'll be hearing from these other guys and have a limited amount of time this morning. But thank you for praying for us. Thank you for sending teams. And thank you for supporting us financially because that's why we start these churches. So those numbers are ours. Well, they're the Lord's. They're the Lord's. But we... We are part of those numbers, is, is, is what I'm saying. And it's just because people are so hungry for the gospel in that part of the world. And so um, I was telling the, the first group that, you know, um, when Brownie sent out all the information on what we wanted to accomplish this week, really been praying. Of course, the verse or the passage that's the theme of this week is in 2 Timothy 1. And, and I encourage you to read that on your own. But I'm going to read verse 9. That's part of it because I think it has to do with the message this morning. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. And one thing that, that, that Brian has been continuously saying is it's a holy calling. It's a holy calling. And I don't know why, but that just resonated in my mind like crazy, because holy means set apart. So you, you might be called to be a doctor or a mechanic or a mom or a dad, and that's an important calling. But this is a holy calling. This is a set-apart special thing. And, and I want to remind you, for everybody who's a believer, that, that he chooses us. And it says it's according to his purpose, to his purpose. So, so what, is that, what, what is that purpose? Um, somebody said the most important thing you can do after you get to know Jesus Christ is to find out what your purpose is and to fulfill your purpose. And I think there's this weird passage in Mark. I'm going to ask you to go to Mark chapter 11. And it's a weird passage there's a weird verse in it. It's something you don't find in the other Gospels, and it's a really strange verse, and I want, you to, I want to set the, the context, and this will all make sense. This is, this is the part where Jesus comes in his triumphal entrance. Remember that? And uh, when he comes in, he comes, he's, he's riding on a donkey, right? And uh, the people say, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And it's Palm Sunday. We celebrate Palm Sunday, or some people still celebrate Palm Sunday. And so they're putting out all the palms, and they're saying, here comes the king. Now, when that happened, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the people that are there, or the sandals of the people at that time. Put yourself in their place. Here comes the king to fulfill this prophecy. This is the prophecy that he was fulfilling. It had said in Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah had said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. So how are they going to know the king's coming? He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, which is the old name for a donkey, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. So Jesus, when he came in, those people got it. This is the king. He's come to rule. But something strange happens after he had come in and been proclaimed as the king. And I want you to see this verse. It's really strange. 
I, I love the strange passages in the Bible. And uh, Mark 11 says in verse 11, let, let me read 9 and 10 so you have the context. I'm in Mark 11, 9. And they, went, and they that went before and they that followed cried, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So they get it. This is the son of David. This is the king. But look at verse 11. This is so weird. And Jesus entered in Jerusalem. Now, now what's Jerusalem for Jesus? It's his city. I mean, it's, it, that's his place. That's where he's going to reign from uh, when he comes back in the second coming. That's his city. And then it says, and into the temple. Now, what's the temple for Jesus? Well, you'll probably remember that when Solomon built the first temple in 1 Kings, it was called the Lord's house. So this is what's weird. Here comes the king. They're proclaiming him the king, right? He goes into his city. He goes into his house. But look at what happens after he goes into his house. This is so strange. And when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So I'm going to try to picture it for you. You come in, it's his triumphant entrance, everyone's proclaiming you as the king, you get off the donkey, you go into your house, you look around, and you're gone. Why? Why did he leave? And it's interesting because it says he goes to Bethany. And let me ask you a question. How many times does the Bible record that Jesus spent the night in Jerusalem? Never. 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 Remember he says that the fox, remember that, they have places to sleep and the son of man does not have a place to lay down his head. He doesn't have a home. So he comes into his house, his city, and leaves. And this is what I think, and, and I'm going to try to prove it. This is what I think. I believe that Jesus was looking for three things and he didn't find them. When John the Baptist came baptizing, he said he was preparing them, preparing the way for the king. And because they did not have prepared hearts, he did not come to reign over that nation. Now that was the temple in those days. It was a physical structure. Well, who is the temple of God now? This is a weird thing. And, and, and it, it, to me it's very interesting. If you look up the phrase house of God or temple of God, it never refers to the individual believer. It's always the church meeting together. But individually, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? 1 Corinthians 6 says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know all this stuff. Because you guys, I know you guys are all over this stuff. And so in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, it says we are the temple of God. Now, how does that work? Okay, here's how it works. Jesus said, when two or three are, are, are um, how do you say it in English? <laughs> meeting in my name, congregando is the word in Spanish. When two or three are meeting in my name, I will be in them, among them. And, and here's another thing. This is interesting. In Revelation, when John sees Jesus, he has seven candlesticks in his hand. Remember that? And what are the candlesticks? The churches. And, and in Ephesians, his warning was, I'll take the candlestick out. Well, what, what's the candlestick? That's Jesus amongst us. So here's how it works. You stay at home, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You'll never be the temple of God until you come to church. Or you come to a gathering with other believers because Jesus shows us among us. The Holy Spirit's where? In us. He comes among us, and we become the temple of God the Father. You see, meeting at church is a miracle. This is a miraculous, mystical experience because Jesus is sitting next to you. He wants to talk to you. He walks among us right now. And I could give you all the scriptures. It's everywhere in the whole Bible. And so the temple that Jesus was looking at is now us. And I believe right now, I'm convinced with all my heart, he's looking for the same three things he was looking for when he went the first time. And when he finds them, he can reign amongst us. He doesn't find it, he's out of dodge, right? He, he's not going to stay. And so what are those three things? And, and so what I want to title the, the message this morning is, what is Jesus looking for in you? What is he seeking in you? I don't know if that's good English, but what is he looking for in you? He, he, he's seeking something that's inside of you. Three things, let's read the verse. Ready? Okay, so he comes and he doesn't see anything, and it says in verse 12, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. So what, was, what do I think Jesus was looking for when he went into the temple? 
because it's throughout the whole Bible, I think he was looking for fruit. And the reason I believe that is because the whole theme of the Bible is bearing fruit. That is it. That's all it is. He made us to bear fruit. What's the first thing he said to Adam and Eve after creating them? Be fruitful. Okay? Adam and Eve messed up. They sinned. Their descendants were disaster, violence, perversion, everything. God sent the flood. What's the first thing he said to Noah and his family? Be fruitful. The reason you and I exist is to bear fruit. Every living thing exists to bear fruit. That's his whole purpose. And so Jesus was looking for fruit, and the fig tree clearly represents the nation of Israel. And that's why when he saw a fig tree, he's teaching the disciples, just like this fig tree doesn't produce, this nation's not producing, and I'm out of here. And it's the same in our lives. And when he talked to the disciples, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Or ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. It's interesting that a lot of people, there's, there's a movement very popular, and I'm not going to say what its name is, where people teach that God chooses you before the foundation of the world to be saved. But when you read every passage on being chosen, it always says he chooses you to serve. And so the funny thing is people use that, they use that belief to prove that God chooses you to be saved, but yet you have chosen people who are lost in the Bible. Let me give you an example. Judas Iscariot. He says, I have chose you 12, but one he was a devil. So Judas was a lost chosen person. Well, how does that work? I thought you're only chosen to be saved. No, you're chosen to serve. God chose Israel, right? And some of them were not believers. He chose the 12, and one was not a believer. And that's what this verse says. He chooses us to bear fruit. He created everything, everything to bear fruit. That's the whole purpose. That's why we're chosen, or we're created. That you should go and bring fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that who, whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he, he may give it to you. So, so Jesus was looking for fruit, he didn't find fruit, and he goes to Bethany. Now, one more thing here. Why did he go to Bethany? Now, where's Bethany? Bethany is the equivalent of you're going to Kansas City, Kansas City proper, Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, you go to Kansas City, Missouri, and um, you go there, and that's where your house is and everything. He says, no, I'm out of here. I'm going to Blue Springs. You go out to Blue Springs. That's about how far Bethany was, more or less. And so why do you go to Bethany? Okay, who's in Bethany that's famous? I'll give you a clue. Two sisters where their first name starts with the same letter and a brother who was resurrected. Right, obviously. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Apparently, that's where he always hung out. And I believe the reason he hung out there was because they were fruit bearers. You see, he finds, doesn't find fruit. He says, I'm going with them. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're fruit bearers. I like what somebody said, and I don't, I don't remember what their name was, but they said, in Jerusalem he found death, in Bethany he found resurrection, Lazarus. In Jerusalem, they were serving themselves. In Bethany, they were serving Jesus. In Jerusalem, they wanted to kill him. In Bethany, they wanted to worship him. Because when he goes back later on in the week, that's where he goes to Simon the leper's house. Remember that? And the woman comes in and sheds, or is that how you say that? Spills out all of the um, uh, perfume on his feet. And, and so that's why he's going to Bethany. I'm going to Bethany because they're fruit bearers. I'm not staying in Jerusalem. Yeah, but Jerusalem's this cool city. It's the center of everything. I don't care. I want to be around fruit bearers. That's what I'm looking for in every moment. So now notice a few things, interesting things here. Notice what God's design for fruit is. Well, what's the purpose of fruit? Why, do, why is there fruit? It says it real clearly. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. What's he looking for? Something to satisfy his hunger. Are we in agreement with that? That's why it says, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came that perhaps he might find anything thereon. Now, one thing that's strange to me is that he was hungry because all Martha ever did was serve him, you know? So I don't know why he was hungry. Maybe he had to get back to Jerusalem as fast as he could, so he got up fast. And so does anybody know what Bethany means? You know, all the bets are house, right? House of figs, yeah. So it's not strange they found a fig tree. So he comes out of the house of figs. He's going back to Jerusalem. He sees a fig tree. He's hungry. What is the purpose of fruit? What's the design for fruit? It's to satisfy your hunger, right? Are we in agreement with that? It, you don't grow apples so that you can say, look, I got about 200 apples on my tree. Aren't they beautiful? Let's take a picture. You going to eat them? No. And are they juicy? Yeah, I, I, just, I was just at my best friend's house. We, we always go fishing. And he, he used to live in California. Now he lives in Wyoming, so we go fishing for, for trout. And um, in his backyard, he had something I had not seen since I was a kid, a crab apple tree. Anybody ever had crab apples? I used to eat those things as a little kid. 
But I said, what are you raising crab apples for? Well, this, this was already in our house or whatever. And, and so, you know, I was talking to his wife about raising crab apples. And so why do we raise fruit to satisfy us? Are we in agreement? The taste and to fulfill us. Why did Jesus want the fruit to be satisfied? Why does God want you to bear fruit? Because it satisfies him. It makes him feel good. It says in John, it says in, uh, John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. You see, when you bear fruit, God goes, wow, I really like that. That is really cool. That, that is a really cool thing. Just like physical fruit satisfies the person who eats it, spiritual fruit satisfies God. I, I, I shared this in the morning that I grew up in an atheist home. And so when I was 14 years old, I was living in Plattsburgh, New York, which is out in the middle of nowhere. It's up near the border of Canada, near Montreal, and Vermont, near Lake Champlain. It's up in the corner. People say, well, I live in upstate New York, and they're about 50 miles north of New York. I live 300 miles north of New York. That's upstate New York, you know. Those guys are pretenders down there, right? Down there in Rochester, they're pretenders, you know. So anyway, so um, where, where I live is out in the middle of nowhere. Well, my dad's in Vietnam, because we lived at the Air Force Base, and my mom died. We're going to the airport in Montreal, Canada, to go visit my, my relatives. Dies of a heart attack at 34. Well, she was an atheist, and uh, she was my whole world. She wasn't just my whole world because I loved her so much, but I realized after she died that she was my whole world for determining purpose in my life. You understand what I'm saying? So when she died, I remember crying out to a God that I didn't even know existed. People say, what happens to the people in the jungle who have never heard the gospel? You're looking at one of them. That's me. I lived in the jungle of upstate New York. And I had never heard about God. I didn't know who Noah was. Nothing. Zero. I had seen Jesus Christ Superstar. Does anybody remember that play when they did it in Montreal? And I thought Jesus is a cool dude that sings cool songs. And I had no idea what any of this stuff was. And so my mom dies. And this is the thing that happened to me. And I, didn't even, I don't even remember if I said God, but I remember crying out every night, I want to know you that made everything. You ever read Romans 1.20 where it says that God reveals his deity and his power through the invisible things so that you have no excuse to not believe? Creation is why I got saved. That, that's why I love, I go to the University of El Salvador and teach on creationism and intelligent design. I love that stuff because that's why I became a believer. So I moved to California. My dad was transferred to California to, to Mayfair Air Force Base in Sacramento. And a guy in, in high school shared the gospel with me. First time I heard the gospel, I said, that's what it is and I got saved. But then I asked this question, what's my purpose? What, why am I here? And it changed my life, 1 Corinthians 6.20. For you, are, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. Oh, that's why I exist. It's to glorify God. That, that's why he saved me and chose me. Well, how do I glorify God? I'm glad you asked that. Here is my Father glorified, that you bear a little bit of fruit, much fruit. And you can take every passage on fruit in the Bible and divide it into two categories, basically. One is winning a person to Christ, and the other is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so in our church, when we started our church, this, was, this is the mission of our church. We exist to glorify God, being channels to expand his kingdom and transform lives. And I've tried to live my life that way. And I mess up all the time, but I've tried to live my life that way because I realize the reason he shed his blood. You were brought with a price. The precious blood of God, his blood, he shed his blood and he paid for me. And he says, therefore, glorify God. And so as I bear fruit, that's a way to uplift God in everything that I'm doing. Now, now one more thing before we continue. They knew the fig tree represented Israel. Everyone knew that clearly. I'm just going to give you one verse here in Hosea 9, 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe or first fruits in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. The fig tree represents Israel. And you're going to see why in a couple of seconds why. So second thing, God's disappointment with fruitlessness. I don't know how many people here have garden, you know, garden where they raise vegetables or if you've ever planted fruit trees. But in El Salvador, you can grow about just anything, grow just about anything because of the climate. You can grow tomatoes three times during the year. It's just all the time you can grow stuff. And, and so my wife has, loves to grow stuff, and um, she's always growing stuff. I mean, she's got so many banana trees that I spent last week posting up banana trees. 
I'm a banana man, you know, so I'm, from, I'm harvesting bananas. And she loves, she loves fruit trees. And we, she tried to grow an avocado tree. And, man, we worked in, in this avocado tree that came time for the fruit, nothing. Cut it down and got another avocado tree. We gave up on avocados. And um, it's so disappointing. It is so disappointing to plant a tree. And then you see the leaves come out, and there's no fruit. See, that's what happened to Jesus. That's what it says here with Jesus. It says, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not. You know that I think of my own life, I don't want to talk about your life because I don't know about everybody's life here, but I know that when God looks for fruit in my life and doesn't see it, he's so disappointed. Because I know the disappointment that I've found when I've invested in planting a tree or a garden or something and there's no fruit. And he says, Steve, I saved you. I gave you time. I gave you gifts. My son Jesus, after, before he came, he, he went back up to heaven to bring gifts to men. He gave you spiritual gifts. What have you been doing with it? I don't see anything. Ah, what a disappointment. It's such a disappointment. And what did Jesus find? Leaves. Now, you could do a study if you had time in the Bible about leaves. Leaves. For example, when, G, when Adam and Eve sinned and they were, they were ashamed, how, how did they try to cover up their shame? With fig leaves, right? Because le- leaves are big and beautiful. They, they cover up what's going on. An, an ugly tree with no leaves is, looks horrible. You get a bunch of leaves and it's beautiful. And so what you have here is you have a tree that only produces leaves. And, and that's a picture of Israel. It says in Hosea 10, Israel's an empty vine. He brings forth unto himself. Think about this carefully. If you have a fruit-bearing tree that produces no fruit, it's doing everything for itself. Are you in agreement with me? It's sucking up all the nutrients that God's provided to just make leaves. And no one can chew on leaves. I know there's some leaves you can eat, but that's no good. It's a very selfish tree if it's not producing fruit. And that was Israel. According to the multitude of his fruit, he hath increased the altars. According to the goodness of his lamb, they have made goodly images. When a tree has leaves with no fruit, it's bearing fruit for itself. For whom are you bearing fruit? For God or for yourself? Are you just a leafy person? Or are you a fruit bearer? If all you have is a bunch of leaves, big beautiful leaves, that's a really sad thing. You know, it's, it's sad to me because I'm getting to a point in my life where, you know, I'm starting to think about um, uh, transition, who's going to take over my place and things like that. Um, the guy I work with is always talking about retirement. I always say, he's trying to retire me. I know behind the scenes he's trying to retire me. But, but anyway, I'm at that age in my life. And a lot of my friends that I grew up with, they're, they're talking about retirement. But I'm thinking in retirement, how can I do more stuff? But they're thinking about how they can tour or how they can see more stuff. And I've always thought about this. Why are Christians the only living things that have this belief system? When I'm young, I'm going to bear fruit, and then I'm going to retire to be fruitless. I don't, I don't get that. I don't, I don't get that mentality, how older people always say, I don't have time, I'm enjoying my grandkids. It's like, w- wait, are you just all of a sudden going to switch into another reality? The greatest time in your life is when you have wisdom. The greatest time in your life is when you can teach younger people what the Word of God says. The greatest time in the life of Abraham, Moses. Moses was a dud until he turned 80. Are you guys agree with me? He was a total dud until he turned 80 years old. And you've got so many of these people, and I'm not here to have a big geriatric you know, message or anything. I'm just making this statement. I don't understand my friends, and this isn't applying to anyone here that say, yeah, I just can't wait to retire so I can get an RV and see the world. Uh-huh. You're just going to be a leafy person. I'm just going to be leafy. Just be really big, beautiful. Are you going to bear any fruit? And so Jesus, you know, you know this is going to sound ridiculous, but this is what I see Jesus as. Does anybody remember an old commercial where there was this old lady coming up to a counter? I think it was Wendy's. And she orders a hamburger, and a hamburger bun comes out, huge bun, and there's a piece of hamburger this size. And you remember what she says? Where's the beef? Jesus is saying the same thing to you. Where's the beef? Well, I got a really cool car. Eh, that's going to burn up. I made some really cool trips. Well, that's okay. I'm not against doing trips. I just, you know, that's an important thing too. 
But if that's all you're about in the millennium, I'm going to see everything. I might make a trip to Israel before I die, but people say, you have to go to Israel. And I says, my goodness, in the millennium, I'm going to go there all the time. <laughs> I've, I've got to go to Mexico. I've got to go to San Pedro Sula. I want to bear fruit. I want to glorify God. I want him to look at me and not be disappointed. Amen. You go to a graduation, and there's only one group of people that's happy. Who, who's the happiest person at a graduation, the happiest group? The graduating students? No. I've watched graduating students be the valedictorian and win the prize, and they come up there and it's like, yeah, whatever, you know, I won valedictorian. But there's a group of people going insane. Who are they? Mom and dad. Because the greatest thing that can happen in your life is to please your mom or your dad. And the greatest thing that's even greater is one day to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's not disappointed with me. Revelation forces we're going to cast crowns before him. I hope you have some. Does it mean you're not going to heaven? No. You can be a leafy person. You can get saved, be leafy, see the world. Go ahead and do it. You're going to heaven. Don't worry about it. But oh, how sad to stand before Jesus and be leafy. He's looking for fruit. He's disappointed. But he's not only disappointed. There's a disapproval of the fruitless. It says, And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Wait a second, that doesn't make sense. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of this hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Why did Jesus condemn a tree for not having fruit when it was not the time of fruit? Isn't that what happened? Did I read this right? Am I reading what it says? It says he comes to it, he sees leaves, it's not the time of fruit, condemns it because it will not give fruit. Why? Because we need to understand the way a fig tree works. You have to understand the way a fig tree works. Now, I'm not a figologist, but, you know, I've stayed in a, what is that commercial, in a Holiday Inn? Anyway, is it Holiday Inn or is it, okay. I'm not a figologist, but I've stayed in a courtyard. That's, that's, where, that's where I'm staying right now. But, it, but this is funny about figs. Okay, a question. What's the only country ever in history that's had a Palestinian president? This country's had two Palestinian presidents. It has one right now, El Salvador. A bunch of you didn't know that. Around the year 1900, many of the Palestinian Catholics that lived in Bethlehem and that part, they fled Israel to move to El Salvador and Honduras. And it's funny because they came with Turkish passports. So we always call them Turcos, which means, which means Turkish people. So our president's name is Naib Bukele. That's a, that's a Palestinian name. And we had another president named Tony Saka. And so because you have a lot of, we call them Turcos, but they're really from um, Palestine, a lot of them, they'll tell you, I know one that comes to our church, her na last name is Saka, her maiden name, and she says, um, it's time for the figs. I've got to bring you figs. And these aren't just any old figs. These are figs from Palestine. And so I've become an expert on figs, just, just in case you want to know about figs. Okay, here's the deal with figs. Figs are weird. They're the weirdest, weirdest thing. How does a normal fruit tree work? Leaves, flower, fruit. Does everybody agree with me? Leaves, flower, fruit. How does a fig tree work? Leaves and fruit, no flower. The Chinese word for fig is fruit, no flower. If you take the two Chinese symbols for fruit and then put no flower, no, tree, no flower. Tree, no flower is a fig. Isn't that weird? So, okay, why does Jesus condemn it? Because when the leaves come out on the fig, the little figgies come out at the same time. And so Jesus knows it's not going to produce fruit. And that's why he condemns that tree at that moment. You have to realize something about God. It doesn't really disappoint him. And this is really harsh what I'm going to say, but it's what the Bible says. A fruitless tree is useless. Deuteronomy 20 clearly says that when they were to conquer cities, don't cut down the fruit trees. But if they don't bear fruit, get rid of them as fast as you can. They're useless. And so always in the Bible when something doesn't bear fruit, you, you, you cut it down every time you can. And there's, there's, there's the fruit as it starts to come out, and there's a ripe, a ripe fig tree. Okay? A lot of you are going to go home and say, what did, what did that guy preach on? Figs. And so that's all you'll remember is the figs. 
But, but that's why he did it. And so anytime in the Bible there's no fruit, it's a problem. John 15, all oh, you know this, I am the vine, Jesus. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Right? How do you glorify God? Much fruit. How do you pray for much fruit? You abide in Jesus. You will produce fruit. And it says, for without me you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them. So who's burned up and condemned? The people? No, the branches. You're saved. You don't bear fruit. He cuts off that part and burns it, is what it's saying. And cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Everything you do in your life that is not to glorify God is burned. It's a waste of time. And when you go before Jesus, it will not be a crown to show to him. It will be a lot of stuff that will be burning. Many Christians have this, this game plan. This is my life plan. You know, it's like when you go to a, you'll get an email about a guy that says, I want to be your financial planner. This is a typical American Christian's financial plan. I'm going to live and invest so I can get more gasoline for the fire. I'm just going to get more stuff, and it'll burn up. It'll be really cool. That's ridiculous. We should live to bear fruit. We should live for eternity if we're believers in Jesus Christ. And so what happens when you don't bear fruit? Well, that's why, that's why Jesus went to the church, and that was it with Israel. In the parable of the vineyard, he says, Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, Israel, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's what he's looking for right now. But one more thing. This is really interesting because I know you wanted to know this. Actually, the fig has fruit. I mean flowers. The, the fig has flowers. You want to know how it works? doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you anyway. A wasp comes and it burrow, burrows a hole inside the fig. And it pollinates it. And so if you open up a fig, you guys see the fig that's cut open? Where's the flower? It's inside. It's the only fruit that the flower is inside. It's internal fruit. That's why it's a picture of Israel. I don't care what you look like outside. I want you to bear fruit internally. That's what glorifies God in every moment. But he's looking for a second thing. You ready? Verse, verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem... And it's interesting, if you want to know what happened with Jesus' last week, only Mark tells you what happens each day. Because every day he goes to Jerusalem, comes back to Bethany, goes to Jerusalem. So he's coming back to, to Jerusalem. It says, they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple. He began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all the nations a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city, back to Bethany. So the first day, looking for fruit, none. Second day, what's he looking for? I believe he was looking for fervor, fervor for God. And what he found was fervor for money. He went into the temple. He wanted to see people worshiping the Lord. They were excited about the Lord. I, I told the first service, what a blessing. I like your background. It's really cool. During the time of the, of the praise and worship, and just to hear people, I love that, just hearing people praising the Lord, wanting to worship the Lord. Jesus loves that kind of stuff. That's why this candlestick is planted there, and he's among us at that time. But he's looking for people that have fervor for him. And Jesus comes into the temple, and what do they have fervor for? Money. Money. I remember when, when, when Madame O'Hare wanted to get rid of In God We Trust on Coins. And I receive these emails. You've got to write an email to get rid of this. And I says, who cares if it says that? We're just propping up a lie anyway. You cannot tell me that our nation trusts in God. Don't tell me that. You do probably. Many people do. But as a nation, they should put an L between the O and the D if they want to be honest. That's honest. And gold we trust. And that's the problem. You can only serve God or what? Mammon. And Jesus saw mammon. They had fervor. Well, as a matter of fact, everyone is fervent for something. As a matter of fact, that for which you are fervent is your God. And so this is the second time that Jesus cleaned out the temple. Does so anybody remember the first time Jesus cleaned out the temple? He cleans out the temple at the end of his ministry? When's the first time? Yep, at the start of his ministry. He, he had zeal. That, that's what it says in John 2 when he did it. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. God's looking for zealous people, radical people, people with fervor for the things of God and not for money. I see fervent people everywhere. There are a dime a dozen. But how many are fervent for God? That's what Jesus was looking for. 
And they were more concerned about making money off of it. And, and Jesus didn't like that. He saved you to be fervent. It says in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. What does it say? Zealous of good works. For what are you zealous this morning? It's really sad to me because, you know, I look at my contemporaries and when I talk to them, whenever I visit them in the States and I'm talking about the work, a lot of them it's like, oh man, that's boring. But if I mention the vaccination, huh, wearing masks, Trump, anything political, they go crazy. Like, I made their day. I don't really care about it, to be honest. It's just a temporary waste of time. Who cares? Eternity is what matters. That is what matters. That, that, that people would know Jesus Christ to bear much fruit for him. But many people are more fervent about the wrong things. I realize politics is important. I realize seeing the world is important. I'm not trying to be legalistic and having a nice house. That's all important. But when that is the thing, what a boring life. What, what, what a miserable life. That's why a lot of Christians, it's like they have a little sand pebble in their shoe. You ever had that before? You're walking, I don't know what's wrong with me. There's something wrong. And some Christians are that way. And you need to analyze your life. Am I producing fruit for Jesus? Am I fervent for Jesus, living for him? You, you remember what, Jesus, what, what God said about people that aren't zealous? Remember that? I know thy works, church of Laodicea that thou art neither cold nor hot. It would thou, I would that thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Not being zealous nauseates God. You, you can't paint it any other way. When, when I was little, my mom, the way she would punish me if I came back late from playing, I'd go out on Saturday play all day. You know, nowadays I know it's tough to let your kids just wander up, but that's the way it was for us. Play baseball all day, play in the woods and everything, and mom would say, be back at five. If I wasn't back at five, this is what my mom would do. She would take out my plate of hot food and just leave it out. So the food was lukewarm. Now, I was telling the congregation in the first service, she used to give me lima beans all the time. Have they outlawed lima beans yet? I want to ask the young people, if you're under 30 years, have you ever had lima beans? Good for you. You have. Oh, I'm sorry. But you know what lima beans are. Okay. Lima beans are horrible. My mom used to make this thing called succotash. It's like, we're just going to find all the vegetables they're giving away on the streets and put it together, you know? All these lima beans. One time I was on a plane, and they offered me some boxes for the meal because, you know, it's COVID. It says, do you want our takeoff, which has got salami and cheese, or do you want the other one that's healthy for us? I said, what does it have? They said, hummus. Hummus? What in the world is hummus? My wife says, it's, it's smashed up garbanzo beans. Aha, uh -huh, there's the lima beans. They've changed the name. I know those are lima beans because garbanzo is probably how you say lima in, in Italian. I don't know. I made that up. But the point I'm trying to make is lima beans are no good. No, the point I'm making is when that food gets lukewarm, it's horrible. If we went out to play in the morning and we came back late, she just let the cornflakes sit in the milk. Soggy cornflakes. So a lot of Christians are just soggy cornflakes. Just sitting there, just gross. Nobody wants to have anything to do with it. We, we exist to satisfy God, to produce fruit, to glorify Him. But many times we're just soggy cornflakes. You know what, G, what, what Jesus said to that church? This is what He said to them in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be what? Zealous. Zeal. The zeal of the Lord. People that are zealous for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not zealous for politics or, or, or for money. And, and one more thing before I go to the last point. Why does he say, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? He's quoting this verse in Isaiah 56, 7. Isaiah 56, 7 says, even them will I bring to my holy mountain, context is the Gentiles, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. We have to realize that the first ones who received the holy calling was the nation of Israel. It's in Exodus 19. He says, I called you to be a nation of priests. Now the church members are the priests. But at that time, the priest was a nation of Israel. And he called them to, be the, to win all the Gentile nations. And he built this temple. And this temple was a special spot where people of other nations could come to be converted. 
And this is kind of how it worked out. And I don't, and I don't know if you can pick out the details, but I'm just going to try to point it out. The way the temple worked was you had on this side two things. The, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could enter in once a year. You guys know that on Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement. Then you had the holy place, which is where the priest could enter in all the days and would do their work, right? And then it, you, if you went into the court that was in the front part where there was the altar, um, the, the brazen altar, it, the men could come in with the sacrifices. Then they had a place for the women. Does anyone see in the bottom left side? Woman's court. Only women that were Jewish could go there. But God wanted the Gentiles to be saved. And so he made a special spot for them where they could come in to the court and observe the Jewish people worshiping the Lord so they could be saved. And you want to know what they were doing there? They were selling doves and exchanging money. Is it wrong to exchange money? No, they had to do it. You have to realize that people came from other nations, they had to exchange money. Was it wrong to sell animal? Of course not. You had to bring an unblemished animal, right? You remember that? Well, who said it was unblemished? A Levite priest. And so they had found a way with their religion to manipulate and take advantage of the people. They say that if you bought a dove outside that area in the time of Annas, he was, he was the, 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 the high priest, it cost a half day's um, work to buy it. Let's say you make $100 a day, it costs 50 bucks. That, that, that's the way it was. But if you bought that same dove inside where the court of the Gentiles was, it was 45 times, 45 days of working. And they ripped them off. And so Jesus comes in and he says, what is going on here? This is the place to win people to Christ. Well, win people to God. And you're selling money. I know this with all my heart. If Jesus came back today, the first place he'd go would be where the televangelists are to take them out with a scourge. I can't stand Christian TV where they're trying to rip people off with money because my family is lost because of that. Many of them have gotten saved, but they, they were. They see religion as they want to take your money. And so when some guy gets on the TV and is ripping people off for money in the name of religion, God detests that. He detests that. He would bring out a scourge if it was at that time. And so Jesus said, this is a place of prayer. This is a place to access, and you're just selling stuff. A horrible thing that was happening there. When we are fervent for money instead of God, those that do not know Christ are stopped from accessing of worshiping God. Every great revival in our country, that's what makes our country great, three great awakenings. Every great revival, you know what happened before it? Economic disaster. I always pray for the candidate that will bring us to economic disaster because it's more important that people look for Jesus. And that was the problem. People are fervent for money. They'll sell their souls for money. And it's sad because money never does anything good for you. Every study they ever do on happiness, every study in every country with every group of people always says, the one thing that makes me happy is some relationship. My mom, my dad, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, God, you know, that relationship. And every one of them says, what's the least thing that makes you happy? Money. But yet people still worship money. It's, it's a tragedy in, in every moment at all the time. One last thing here that's interesting. So Jesus comes in, look at this contrast. He sees people selling and making money in the place where they should be trying to win Gentiles to, to, to the Lord. He goes back to Bethany. He goes to the house of Simon the leper. This lady comes in who nobody likes. Ew, this lady from the street comes in. She pulls out a, a bottle, I think that's the word in English, of alabaster, of perfume. Very expensive. And she breaks it. And she puts it over Jesus. Now who did, God want, who did Jesus want to hang out with? The religious leaders? No way. He wanted to hang out with her in that moment. And then it says in Matthew 26, 13, Verily I say to you, what, who, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Because what did she do? What did she have to offer? Was she a great religious orator? She just had that perfume, and she gave it. Jesus will always leave religious people who are fervent for money to be with those who are fervent for him and worship him. And the last part, I'm going to make a quick mention. I'm going to see if you can guess what the last word is. It starts with an F. Verse 20. And in the morning, coming right back again, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried upon, up from the roots. And Peter called to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answered, saith unto him, Have, what does it say? 
Uh huh. Have faith in God. For verily I send you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that these things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Right, what's the last thing? Faith in God. Faith in God. Hebrews eleven six says, Without faith, it sure is hard to please God. Does it say that? I saw some of you saying what it says, because I know you know what it says. Without faith, it is really difficult to please God. What does it say? Without faith, it is impossible to, to please God. I want you to pray for something for me in my life as I go into the, the next years of my life, that my faith would grow. You know, growing up in an atheist home, I was filled with all the stuff that was bad about faith, you know, just, just how horrible. You know, it was like, you have faith, I have reason. You know, Christians are stupid, all that stuff. I just, that, that, was, that was my diet. Then I become a Christian, and I go study chemical engineering at the University of California. It's like, what is wrong with you? You were right before. What, what are you doing? Have they brainwashed you? And I always say, I was brainwashed before. You know, now I'm, I'm understanding some stuff. I'm starting to learn stuff. And, and, and that's just always been a big deal with, with faith. You know that when God called us to El Salvador, um, I thought, because I'd read about George Mueller, and I invite you guys to read about George Mueller sometime, I thought that what you did is you sold everything and just moved there. And so that's basically what we did. And um, when we came back one time to the States, a guy called me and says, you know, Leo Humphrey, many of you know him, and he, he was like my dad, and he says, well, Leo Humphrey said that you're in the States. He says, are you doing deputation? And I thought, what in the world is deputation? I had no idea, and I thought, what am I going to tell this guy? Because I guess so, you know, I guess so. So I had to look it up afterwards. And deputation is necessary for missionaries. If you have missionaries come in here, it's, all, it's totally necessary. But when I got saved, my family was so against Christianity, I spent my whole life, and I've tried to do it, to prove, prove God by seeing him do great things. And I've seen him do incredible things. The greatest miracle you will see today is me standing here. If they would have voted in my high school yearbook, a class of 400, who is the most shy person you've ever met? I wouldn't have won because no one knew who I was. <laughs> if you look at old pictures in those days, there might be a picture of me and someone will say, who is that guy? Shyest person in the world. The first time I went with my wife, she asked me out. I'm a shy guy and I'm standing here and I haven't fainted yet. And that's God, it's not me, I'm a loser. But God is incredible. I hear people say this all the time. Well, God can't use me. I'm not as smart as you or eloquent. And if it's a friend, I'll say this, because it's going to sound sarcastic. But if it's a friend, I'll say, oh, that's too bad. Your God is so small. Your God is so tiny, he can't overcome your problems. You're a superstar. You know, you are a superstar if God can't use you because your problems are so big. You're so important, God can't use you. I'm being sarcastic. I know that. I'm sorry. But you guys are friends. You see, when you've gone through some rotten stuff in your life, when you've got everything against you, that's when the party begins because you can see this incredible God. And God does incredible things. And, and so can you imagine this? One day it's like this, the next day it's like that. And Peter goes, my goodness. And Jesus says, you've got to have faith. It has well been said that faith is not believing in spite of the evidence. That's what I was taught. That's superstition. But, obeying in spite, but it's obeying in spite of circumstances and consequences. The next time I heard somebody say, I only believe in what I can see, I'm going to throw up all over the screen. How many of you have seen protons? If anyone here raises their hand, I'm out of here. Because no one's ever seen a proton or an electron or a quark or dark matter or a black hole. I can go on and on. All the stuff you hear these guys and discover, oh, we've just discovered this black hole and this kind of thing. No one's ever seen it. Because you see what faith is? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and it's the what? Evidence of things not seen. I believe in God because I'm an evidence person. I'm a science guy. I know he exists. It's a fact. When a person doesn't, it's a huge ignorance. I was very ignorant. But when the evidence was presented, I believed. That's what faith is. And so the problem with many people is they doubt, like Peter. And that's why Jesus did the miracles, so that their faith would grow in every morning, at, at every moment. Now, why did he say you could move that mountain? He's speaking in metaphors. 
You know, one of the things that bothered me when I first became a Christian was all the symbolism in the Bible. And so I remember someone told me, well, the reason God speaks in symbolism is because that's the way we talk. It was raining really hard. It was raining cats and dogs. We talked that way all the time. Leo used to always say, it's hotter than a nanny goat in a pepper patch. And, and so <laughs> Leo had all these dumb sayings like that. Someday I'll share some with you. But the point I'm making is we talk that way all the time. You probably have an uncle or grandpa that talks that way because we appeal to imagination. God's the same way. I mean, the Bible would be boring if it said in the beginning God made everything, then he made man and woman, then they sinned, then Jesus came, he died for your sins, and you get saved the end. But no, it's incredible. It's these stories, it's metaphors. So here's the metaphor. There's this huge mountain, the Mount of Olives. And Jesus says, you, you're doubting. You're doubting what I can do, and that's like a mountain in your life. The nation of Israel, their mountain was that they weren't producing fruit. But if you'll believe, just believe, it's like taking this mountain and tossing it in the, in the, in the sea. And I believe we're living in the greatest time in history because the world's such a disaster. And this is an opportunity to see God do incredible things. Don't misunderstand what I'm going to say, but I'm glad for coronavirus. I've lived in a country of disasters. El Salvador's disasters. We've been through three earthquakes over seven. We've been through hurricanes, chikungunya, Zika, all these weird diseases. Coronavirus comes, okay, another one of these things. We're just disasters all the time. But when I moved to El Salvador, it was 10% evangelical. Now it's 40%. Because the disasters cause people to look for Jesus. The greatest time to share your faith right now in the middle of COVID. I hate COVID. I hate coronavirus. But I love the opportunity we have to reach people with the gospel. Jesus is coming. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? I mean, what's he looking for? Fruit? Fervor and what? Faith. Because a lot of you are saying right now, I can't do this, man. I can't do this. And, and I always tell people it takes this much faith to believe that God can save you. It takes this much faith to believe that God can save your mom and dad, your neighbors, and the people around you. And many people get to this point. But here's the cool place. It takes this much to believe that God can use you. Yes, you. You. And the more things you have against you, excellent, the more disasters because the bigger faith you're going to have and who's going to be glorified more. That's why God uses the no nobodies. And God wants to use you. We're in the greatest time. Pray this week that our faith will grow. Pray that God will use us as we go through this week. And pray that God will use us to be relevant in this time where people need the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for you making it so clear what you're looking for in our lives. And I pray for every person here present, Lord, that I pray that we would bear fruit, much fruit, that we'd be fervent for you, and that we would believe that you could use us. And I pray if there's somebody here this morning that does not know you personally, that has not put their faith in you originally so they could be saved, I pray you would touch their heart right now so they can make that decision. And Lord, I pray that those of us that have already saved you, Lord, that we could bear fruit in our lives so that we would glorify you and please you. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you've come this morning and God's spoken to your heart and you've realized, this is a personal thing, you've realized, I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, but I want to receive Christ this morning. I want him to live in my life. All you have to do is believe that you're a sinner, that Jesus died for your sins, that all he was buried, he rose the third day, and that he wants to live in your life. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them and sup with them. And how do you open the door of your heart? Praying. Let me help you with the words that I said when I prayed and asked the Lord to save me. You don't have to pray out loud, but say this to Jesus if you want to be saved. Say, dear Heavenly Father, right now I recognize I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. I repent of all my sins and I open the door of my life and ask you to come in. Come in, Lord Jesus. Save me, change me, make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for hearing my prayer, and thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. And with our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, did you ask him to save you? If you did.